Dr. Keanu Sai, uh, many of you have probably heard of him before and the work that he's done. Um, he's not necessarily one to put himself in the public spotlight. Uh, but he has, he has been involved with us and, and helped us in this struggle with Mauna Kea since 2015. Uh, he came up to the Mauna, he, he talked with us, and, um, and I actually went with him to Canada uh, in 2015, and we filed um, war crime complaints with the Canadian government. And so, um, if you don't know, Keanu's, Keanu has provided um, many of us with a lot of information and a lot of ike that had purposely been hidden from us over the generations. Um, and in the beginning, kind of sounded crazy to a lot of people. Uh, but as time has gone on and we've been able to hear more and learn more from him and, and dig into these truths, uh, we've seen that it's not crazy. It's just the truth. And so um, he's come up again to share some mana'o with us. And so we're going to pass it over to him. And we just want to mahalo him again for taking the time out of his schedule to come here uh, to support us again for the second time on Mauna Kea as we, as we work to stop the desecration of our Mauna and stop the building of the 30 meter telescope. So without further ado, we want to hand it over to Dr. Keanu Sai. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, to the kupuna for uh, inviting me. Appreciate it. I was not here because I have a reason. My wife and I were celebrating our 30th anniversary in Europe. <laughs> so we just got back a few days ago. And uh, a lot of people didn't know that I actually had a, a wife. <laughs> they thought I was uh, a maverick. you know. So in Kohoka he said, I'm not in the public eye. Well, some of you might remember when I used to be in the public eye back in the 1990s about land titles, perfect title company. And that's when I got arrested for racketeering, money laundering, tax evasion, and theft. That pretty much was in the public eye. <laughs> but what that did was it showed how people were not educated on what the truth is. And later, what I needed to do was to go ahead and get a PhD in political science, which was saying the same thing. There is a publicist, a British publicist, a novelist. His name is Donald Wheel. And he has this quote that I love to use, because it's so appropriate when new information is coming, like what we have in Hawaii, the truth. And he says, when a well-packaged, web of lies has been passed down through generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. Now that lunacy that we all had experienced has now become the normalcy. Now we've begun to normalize an understanding of our kupuna for who they were and not who we want them to be. Because who they were is what we need to be. Because they knew who they were, we are now beginning to learn who they were in order for us to know how to move forward. That's important. Now what we exposed at the university through research and articles, which has spread not just throughout Hawaii, but also academic-wise throughout the world, internationally, is that we have a reason for not knowing. See, and that's good. In 1906, they formed, they established a policy called denationalization, which was specifically called Program for Patriotic Exercises to be used in the public schools. That policy stemmed from a position statement that was made by Samuel Damon in 1895, who was an insurgent with the so-called Republic of Hawaii, and this is what he said back then. He said, in order to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is we must obliterate the past. That policy, or that opinion, was then put into a policy in 1906. 
That's my tutu's generation. My tutu was born in 1910. My tutu's parents were born in Napo'opo'o in 1880. So I have a connection to Hawaii Island, Mokuokeave. My family is buried at Kahikolu Church, Napo'opo'o. But when my tutu went to school, like all of our tutu, yeah, of that generation, they were led to believe something that wasn't true. They were Americanized. If you look at the book, Program for Patriotic Exercises, it was all about American history, nothing about Hawaii. And then, in order to extinguish the language and control our people, they banned the language in the schools, and if you spoke Hawaiian, which was the national language, because even Japanese, Chinese were speaking Hawaiian, like how you speak Hawaiian or how you speak Chinese in China, Spanish in Spain. But if you did speak it, you were beaten. Now, to what degree the beating or the discipline was would vary, but that would be the mo'olelo of our kupuna that shared those stories. Those are those stories that we cannot forget, but by the time my parents went to school, and my dad went to St. Louis, he was born in 1939, and back then it was called St. Louis College, from the Kingdom Era. And Uncle Jimmy Nanioli was there with them. This information about America was already institutionalized. By the time it got to myself, when I attended the Kamehameha schools from 1978 to 1982, it's called out of sight, out of mind. I knew nothing, nothing. Aole. In fact, after Kamehameha, I went on to a military college, New Mexico Military Institute, to get a commission as a second lieutenant and an associate's degree in pre-business because I thought I wanted to be just like my uncles who were in the Army. But my uncles who were in the Army, they were drafted during Vietnam. But it's just, that was my memory. I wanted to be like them. So, in 1984, when I returned home from New Mexico military, entering the University of Hawaii to finish off my bachelor's, my tutu got cancer, and I'm the oldest mo'opuna, Rose Kikai Kuihala Simerson Reeves. And she told me that she's not gonna die, she tells my mom to convey to me at New Mexico before I came home, that she's not gonna pass away until I come home. So when I came home, my uncle, because we lived in Kuleo Valley, nine acres, the old homestead, the Reeves Ohana. So my uncle Hank Reeves, my mom's brother, the house next door, one of the rooms was converted to a hospice. So all my tutu wanted me to do was to come over and talk story. Actually, it wasn't talking story. It was actually listening. It wasn't about me talking. All I did was sit down and my tutu would tell me nobody else coming to the room. My uncles and aunties had to stay out, close the door, and I would just sit there. And she would share with me, mo'olelo. Now my tutu was born in 1910. She, she's right at that turn, yeah? That huli, right? And all she did was just talk about when she was growing up. And all I did was listen. And then one particular story that really stood out for me was she was talking about my uncle Paneko, who I knew as an older uncle, who always came over to Kuli O'o, but my uncle Paneko was younger than my, my tutu. And he said, she was talking about how, my, how she was sad for my tutu. I mean, sorry, my tutu was sad for uncle Paneko because he got dirty lickings. Because he didn't properly bow to the prince. And then my tutu keeps going on. And then I went, tutu, wait, wait, trust out. Who's Prince? We got an uncle named Prince. No, no, Prince Kuhio. What? Prince Kuhio? Yeah. He always comes over. He's a good friend. He's good friends with my dad. What? My tutu shared nothing like that when we were all growing up. Nothing. But she was just talking like it was normal. And then more stories started to come out. And then, before she passed away, she told me, Keanu promised me one thing. Know your genealogy. That's what she said. Know your genealogy, mo'oku'auhau, 
Because in that genealogy, you will know who you are and what you need to do. That's what she said. Now, at that time, I didn't understand really what that meant. By the time I'm at the University of Hawaii in 1984, oh boy, everything was blowing up at that time. <laughs> Professor Honani Trask. Then I get to meet Kaleko over here. <laughs> he and I go way back. <laughs> we was part of the first Kua'ana recruiting Native Hawaiian students with Ekela, trying to get them into university. Too funny how he both, now he and I teach at the university. <laughs> <laughs> and both of us still, and we got bolo head. <laughs> well, they say grass does not grow on a heavily used road. There's a lot of traffic going on up here. So all those people who got a lot of hair, well, you know. <laughs> Who's thinking? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> hey, Kalani. Right on, Kalani. <laughs> and Kalani and I go back at the University of Hawaii, and Kua'ana. So a lot of us, you know, a lot of people think I'm this legal political guy, right? Actually, I'm just a Hawaiian. I served time in the military, 10 years, got out as a captain, I was a field artillery officer. We used to fire a lot of rounds over here, yeah? In fact, the unit that I was in is now in Afghanistan, got deployed. So a lot of our local people and Hawaiians have Hawaiians abroad who are in the military. But a lot of this stuff has, has, has gotten me to, to, to know who I am and to prepare me for what I'm doing now. But I did not take up my tutu, her request to know my genealogy, until 1992. This is 1984. 1992, I'm not angry anymore. See, back at UH, Kind of blame the Aulis for everything. Kind of like blame the missionaries. And I kind of sounded like I was a walking contradiction because I'm part Aulis. <laughs> and I used to be on altar boy at Holy Trinity. You could see that, like, ah. Uh. But then, once I got disciplined from a military standpoint, just focus on career stuff. Back then, we're taking on the Soviet Union, so you, you got to be get you got to get serious. The first Gulf War in 1990, I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as a captain. That also helped me to understand, I, find out, I found out, with who we are now. But then in 1992, I went, ah, oh, I, I, I don't know my genealogy, my tutu. So the first thing I did was I went to the archives. I asked the archivist, you know, I hear you guys kind of help people do genealogy. And you kind of point me where I need to go? Because I have no idea where to begin. I think we all know what that's like. He said, oh, just go look at this book. Okay, start off there. And that book was uh, Hawaiian Genealogies by um, Edith McKenzie and Ishmael Stagner. It was a collection of newspapers, articles from the Kamakai Nana. Well, not articles, but genealogies that was printed in 1896, the whole year. So I went to the last name, Samerson, and the name Samerson is not a normal name, right? So I went into the index, look up Samerson, that's my tutu's maiden name, and it, Samerson, page, I think it was 58 or something. Look, turn to page 58, wow. The genealogy was in 1896, and it went all the way to my tutu's dad, William Kuakini Samerson, his brother and sister. Those are the ones in Kaikolu, the church. And then it goes back to Liloa. I was like, whoa. Then it said, Mo'oku'au Hawali. Whoa. I was like, what? Then I wanted to know who these people were, not just names on a piece of paper. As an officer, former officer, former officer I want to do intel. I'm going to spend a lot of time in the archives digging up stuff. William Kuakini Simerson. Okay, you're my great-grandfather. I want to know where you live. I want to know where you worked. I wanted to know where your father worked. My great-great-grandmother, grandfather. I wanted to know Liloa. All of a sudden, I'm going into ruling chiefs. And I was just hungry. 
hungry for information because now it was personal. It wasn't like I was doing research for a class. This was personal. And that's when I went down the rabbit hole. Well, actually, I like to use it more appropriately. My cousin Keanu Reeves, both of us named after my grandfather, Henry Keanu Reeves. And we're the same age. We're still waiting for Keanu to suffer from the Reeves curse. <laughs> we used to play together when we were young. In fact, Jimmy Kimmel Live, when he was promoting his book, John, uh, his movie, John Wick, remember that? Jimmy Kimmel so asks him, and you can, guys can look it up on, on YouTube. You know, I'm amazed at the name Keanu. I never heard of that name Keanu before. Have you ever met another Keanu? He goes, yeah, I got a cousin. He went, you got a cousin named Keanu? Yeah, I'm Hawaiian. We got cousins. And then he starts to talk and share the story about when he and I first met. Because his grandmother's Auntie Momi Victor, who married my Uncle Sam. And he would bring him home, and my Auntie Momi would call my tutu, hey, bring Keanu over to meet Keanu. And I still think his best movie is Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> but in that movie, remember The Matrix? Yeah, The Matrix? It's like the illusion as opposed to the reality. And the only time you can see the reality, you got to take the red pill. In the archives, I took the red pill. And I found out that my tutu was Morpheus. <laughs> She gave me the choice, red or blue. In the archives, I took the red. So when I started to look up things, one thing that I started to realize was that what I was taught at the university and at Kamehameha regarding the Hawaiian kingdom was not correct. I'm not putting blame on anybody. I'm just saying it wasn't correct. But remember, Americanization, right? See, that's what I started to see. Because the one thing that I noticed that really resonated with me was my experience with the first Gulf War in 1990 in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as a captain, going through officers at dance course. We are, at that time, when the first Gulf War occurred, called Desert uh, Shield, before it goes into Desert Storm, we're getting live intel coming in and we're processing that intel into battle plans, assuming we might get deployed. That's how serious things were. But one thing that I understood and thought was just how it was, was that when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and overthrew the Kuwaiti government, Kuwait still existed as a country. In the army, we called that occupation. And that it was our job to expel the Iraqis out of Kuwait so that the Kuwaiti government can come back. The point that I'm making is what was overthrown in 1990 by the Iraqis was the government, not Kuwait as the country. And that's when I went, whoa, wait a minute. 1893, the Hawaiian Kingdom government was overthrown, admitted by President Cleveland, done by an act of war. Those are his words. That's war stuff, invasion. So the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government on January 17, 1893 was no different than the Iraqi overthrow of the Kuwaiti government in 1990, but that didn't overthrow Iraq, I mean, sorry, Kuwait, because the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government didn't overthrow the Hawaiian Kingdom. It would still exist. And that's when I started to see things in a different light because Sovereignty, then, is not something we chase because we don't have it yet. Sovereignty is still in the country, just like Kuwait still had sovereignty, but they weren't in control of the sovereignty. That's different. And that's where the laws of occupation come in. And all of a sudden, my military experience is putting this whole thing together. Remember, I'm not even a political scientist at this time. I'm just a grunt. And that's when I started to realize, well, then how did the Hawaiian Kingdom as a country become a part of the United States? Because it obviously wasn't overthrown in 1893, because you cannot overthrow a country. 
but you can overthrow the government. And yes, it was a fact. It was overthrown, and they apologized. But the country still exists. The only way that one country can get another country, you need a treaty. A treaty transferring one country to another. And did you know our kupuna, hui aloha aina, and the hui kalai aina, the petitions, were there to let Congress know in September of 1898 that this treaty that they entered into with insurgents that they put into control of Hawaii, you cannot ratify or approve it. So the move in Hawaii was one of unity. The signature petitions showed that. And they had a focus. That objective was kill the treaty. How do you kill the treaty? Under American law, you get a petition, you get the people's voice put on record, and you submit it to the Senate, and you say, aole. And it wasn't just aole, what was on paper. You had James Kaulia, David Kalau Kalani, and others, Mr. Richardson, in Washington, D.C., meeting with Queen Lili Okalani, and orchestrating and getting into that plan of, now you pound the pavement, and you hit every senator that gave their opinion that they're going to prove the treaty, and you change them. And they did. They did. They killed the treaty. The treaty's dead. Nothing was transferred. So the Spanish-American War breaks out a few months later, and then they say, we're going to just take away by passing a law, a joint resolution of annexation. Congress passes a law to annex Hawaii. Did you know that that is exactly what Saddam Hussein did with Kuwait by passing a law saying Kuwait is now part of Iraq? But even though that was done, we all knew that was illegal because Kuwait still existed. And then we find out our kupuna, when you read the newspapers back then, they all knew they killed the treaty. They're talking about it. In fact, a guy named Thomas Clark was pretty explicit and it was noted in the Maui News in 1901. But how is it that we don't know that? Because I had no idea of anything about a treaty. I didn't even know about how Hawaii got annexed. I just assumed Hawaii was annexed. See, one thing that we learned in the Army as a young lieutenant, what taught me, is one colonel told me, Lieutenant, you never assume because you make an ass out of you and me. Assume. You guys got down. So then I would say, sir, I'll get back to you with information. We've always assumed, we've been assuming, as opposed to knowing. But now we have a re but now we know why we didn't know. But now we know there's no excuse. Now we know, now we have to continue where Kupuna left off. So, American laws passed in the United States had no effect in Hawaii. None. And that's not a political statement. In order for the U.S. Congress to bring their laws to Hawaii, to create the state of Hawaii, to create the lease with the University of Hawaii, to create the sublease with TNT, you've got to be in the United States. If you're not in the United States, then that means that whole thing is invalid. That's like uh, TNT has a sublease from the University of um, uh, Baghdad for building a telescope on Mount Fuji in Japan. You need to make sure that you're in Japan in order to have a valid lease. So when I'm looking at these things that have and resonate to issues like Mauna Kea, but across all of the Pai Aina, I began to realize back then I might be in the wrong army. That was like, hmm? That is when I quickly moved from the OMG to the WTF. <laughs> With all due respect to the Kupuna, and they're smiling so they know. <laughs> and I had to make decisions. So I put in my papers 
Honorably discharged after 10 years. My last command was trolley battery, artillery. I got out and I walked the talk. That's when 1995, that's when you start to see things hitting the fan. But can you see what I just shared with you is that I could not come to that point in 1994 without going through my experience and knowing who I am beforehand. Because what I did in 1994 was really not a decision. It was a consequence. It was a consequence. The word for future in the Hawaiian language, as everyone knows, is kava mahope. Literally the time of the past. Not kava mamua, the time of the future. So when you say to a Hawaiian, look to the future, they look to the past. And that past includes a second ago, to a minute ago, to a hundred years ago. And that's what we call the mo'olelo. Within that mo'olelo, you will capitalize on successes and you will learn from mistakes. And then you will get ike. Now you see something that you didn't see before. That is what I went through. If you notice, everything I shared with you before I talked about what I decided to do was everything I did that made this a mere consequence. I didn't hold any bad feelings to the United States military. It's just that the United States military is not supposed to be here and it's illegal. Wrong country. And that's not a political statement, it's just a fact. And in fact, when I talk to military people, I get to talk their language, which is the language of, hey, according uh, to Field Manual 27-10, laws of occupation, you're actually illegally occupying a foreign state. You need to comply with the Hague Geneva Conventions, Article 43, Hague Convention, Article 64, Geneva Convention. Got it. Thank you. See, everything in the Army is rakes, regulations. Guess what? We've been following the wrong rakes. It's like we're playing in a football game, but we've been using baseball rules to explain it. From Americanization. Now, we're learning and knowing football. Football rules. And now all of a sudden, what Queen Lilith Wokalani did in 1893 now resonates. Whoa, I totally see what she did now. I don't give any excuses. She locked it. Whoa, I can see why the Hui Aloha Aina did what they did. Why James Kaulia? Why David Kalau Kalani did what they did? See, now their life and their actions speak louder. And it resonates to us now. Because we need to know and understand that just as a, they did what they're supposed to do because they love their country is what we're supposed to do because our actions will be looked upon by future generations. Just as we are looking back to them, think about your great granddaughter looking back at you. See, everything is backwards because that's the strength, not forward. Yeah, somebody tells you go forward, that means they're operating on their past. So how does this all come into play here? Well, I had the privilege of being at the university teaching. So I got to be careful not getting arrested for racketeering anymore. <laughs> Which was all trumped up. Trumped up. Yeah, Trump. <laughs> trumped up. <laughs> Everybody lies. You don't know what is fact from fiction. What I need to do is, I believe that education is important because I came from the position of I had to get educated myself. And why would somebody have to re-experience what I experienced, but actually continue where I left off with that experience and experience more? It's not what somebody can do to help with the movement. When I speak to young students in the high school or college, it's what you can do to get back to your country. Whatever that capacity is, being a doctor, right? Being a lawyer. Joseph Navahi was an attorney. He wasn't just a taro farmer, but he, I'm sure he had a lawyer, right? We need to know that we as a people are diverse and we all have kuleana. And whatever that kuleana is, you got to know it. Not somebody telling you what your kuleana is. And how do you know your kuleana? You got to know your history. 
You got to know who you are, where you came from, and what you got to do. And whatever you got to do, be the best at what you can do. You want to be a cop? Be the best cop you got to be. Be mindful you got to follow the law. The question is, who's legal? Who's not legal? Right? So now I'm going to come in away from my personal side of why I got to where I am to talk a bit about Mauna Kea, specifically native tenant rights and why the lease is invalid. On January 5th, sorry, July 5th, this past July, after I gave two presentations to the Maui County Council Land Use Committee, if any of you folks haven't seen that, if you ever get a chance, check that out because that was unbelievable. Because I am talking history, I'm showing it, and they're getting it. And we were actually conversing, not talking at each other, but question, answer, dialogue. It changed them. They want more information. That's the approach. They admit Hawaii's occupied. Now what do we do in line with the law of occupation? Now remember, imagine, that statement right there would have been considered lunacy 20 years ago. Now it's normal. So Tamara Paulton, the chair of the Land Use Committee, on July 5th, sent a, uh, a letter was dated July 5th, sent to me, asking me what are my thoughts on Mauna Kea, because things were building up. <coughs> they didn't happen yet. It was about to happen. They identified what date they're going to be there. So Tamara wanted to know what was my insight, given what they've learned in the workshops that I provided. So I put together information for tomorrow and it focused on three points three salient points number one the lease is invalid it's not a political statement what took place on Mauna Kea with the previous telescopes is destruction of property called the war crime and third native tenant rights in the land so first let me explain why the lease is invalid because what Tamara is going to do then is on July 9th, the day before the arrest, she sent a letter to Lasner, President Lasner, because they hold the lease with TMT to show him that the lease is invalid. Here's the evidence. Destruction of property. Here are the crimes. Native tenant rights. They have more rights there than University of Hawaii and that she would send that to President Lasner and basically say, refute this. Give this to your legal counsel. Don't give it to a political party. Give it to your legal counsel and refute this evidence. That's what she's going to do. So, the evidence of why the lease is invalid, this, well, the area up there is Kaohe, the Ahupo of Kaohe. This is Humuula. This is crown land. That's government land. These lands were identified as such in 1848 under the Hawaiian statute as a result of the Great Mahele. So Kaohe, where the proposed construction is going to be, is on government land. Government land under the administration of the Minister of the Interior. But subject to the rights of native tenants. Now, subject to the rights of native tenants under Hawaiian Kingdom law is access as one aspect. Access to Mauka, access to Makai, you cannot prevent that. It is part of lands in Hawaii, not just Kaohe. It also is a right to acquire fee simple title called Kuleana. So when you get a kuleana, a native tenant can actually buy 50 cents an acre, which is $16 today, inflation calculator. You apply to the Minister of the Interior, you get your property under a royal patent grant. So that is all exercising native tenant rights. That's why our people never are supposed to be landless or homeless. They're supposed It's already incorporated in the Hawaiian Kingdom law. So... 
That's government land. Then we get into 1893, the Hawaiian Kingdom government was illegally overthrown. But the overthrow did not affect the title of that property. It still belonged to the Hawaiian government, but they weren't around. Just like how the Kuwaiti government wasn't around. That they didn't mean Iraq owned everything during the occupation. No, it still belonged to Kuwait as this land would still belong to the Hawaiian government under the Minister of the Interior. As Humaula would still belong to the Crown Land Commissioners. Right? That's the legal system we had. And especially by the fact that President Cleveland, in 1893, said that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. That means the provisional government is not a government, and Kaohe still belongs to the Hawaiian government, kingdom government. Nothing changed. Then the, the provisional government changes their name to the Republic of Hawaii. They're portraying themselves as if they're a government. And then they want to become a part of the United States, so they sign a treaty with the United States, a treaty of annexation in 1897, February 14th, transferring all government and crown lands to the United States. That transferring of lands that you see in that so-called joint resolution, in that treaty, sorry, in that treaty, is what would come to be known as ceded lands. The word seed is session, to convey, to transfer. But the only way you transfer is by a treaty. Well, that activated our kupuna and our queen to kill the treaty, which was in the Senate. And that is the reason why our petitions were done, with the purpose of killing that treaty. And they succeeded. They killed it. The treaty's dead. Our kupuna, successful. Now, a joint resolution passed by Congress saying, well, we still acquired ceded lands is not true. That's a myth. Kalekoa knows what political myths are. He debunks them. This is a myth that we have to debunk because a joint resolution did not transfer anything to anybody because a joint resolution is Congress saying, I own it. No, no, you're supposed to say, I cede to Congress these territories then Congress says, I own it. You're missing the first step. And then the brainwashing. So then, these so-called lands of Kaohe, well, these lands that were supposedly transferred, which included Kaohe, in 1959, when the United States Congress passed another law, creating the state of Hawaii, Section 5B of the Statehood Act, transferred, supposedly, Kaohe and other government lands and crown lands to the state of Hawaii. That's why Department of Hawaiian Homelands as Humaula and the State of Hawaii Board of Land and Natural Resources have Kaohe. But the problem is nothing was ever ceded in 1898. This is all fiction. That's all it is. And then in 1968, the State of Hawaii Board of Land and Natural Resources enter into a lease, a 65-year lease with the University of Hawaii for 11,000 acres on a summit. And then the University of Hawaii enters into subleases with other telescopes, and then currently we have a sublease with TMT. This is the genealogy of Kaohe. I was trying to rough it out, huh? but I'm watching everybody else pulling up, you know, in umbrellas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So now it's hard to talk. You know, my hand got to go. <laughs> so when we look at this as the genealogy, just remember, remember, like what, remember what my tutu told me. You have to know your genealogy. That doesn't just mean the genealogy of people. You need to know the genealogy of places. You have to know the genealogy of events. Remember, Kavama Hope applies not just to humans, it applies to everything. So now that we're looking at our genealogy, I can come to a conclusion, which is a consequence, with Tamara Paulton, the Maui County Council member, and I can now definitively show her there is no lease, period. 
Here's the evidence. Then we move on to the second part of the letter that Tamara sent to President Lazner, and that was regarding destruction of property. Because we're not part of the United States, because we were never part of it, we were just led to believe we are, the laws of occupation apply. These are international laws, okay? which was covered in my doctoral dissertation. Under international law, the law of occupation, you're supposed to follow certain rules, namely, you're supposed to administer the laws of the occupied country, not that you own it. If you, if you overthrew that government, you need to replace it and maintain the protection of the public and the citizens and the civilians within the territory. So just as the United States, when it invaded Iraq, yeah, the second Gulf War, they overthrew Saddam Hussein's government, the first thing that the United States military had to do was establish a coalition provisional authority which administered Iraqi law, not American law. There was no American law being applied in Baghdad during the occupation, because you cannot. And if you do, that's a war crime called usurpation of sovereignty. So what happened here is that the war crime specifically that applies to this particular area is a particular war crime under Article 147 of the Geneva Convention. Destruction of property that belongs to a state, which is the country that was occupied. And the destruction of property is destruction of property without the consent of the owner. Who's the owner of Kaohe? The Hawaiian government. Where's the Hawaiian government? Overthrown. So if they're overthrown, how do you get their consent? They're not around. No, just right now, they're not around. For the sake of Kaohe, what I'm saying is, if they're not around because that's the entity that is supposed to be entering into the lease if you're going to build a telescope. That's how it's supposed to work. But they didn't do that, and they still went up there and destroyed it. Now, to, to say destroyed it, I'm not saying it because I came to an opinion. I'm actually making reference to the recent decision in 2018 on TMT by the, US, by the Hawaii Supreme Court. Actually, the Hawaii Supreme Court explicitly stated, how's this logic, that the seven telescopes that were built on Kaohe have already destroyed the property. So having TMT go up there and do their construction is not going to destroy something anymore that has already been destroyed. That's from their decision. I'm not making that up. And that's why one of the, the uh, uh, Associate Justice Wilson gave that opposing opinion, dissenting opinion, saying, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> we just admitted to destroying the property. And that's not even talking about TNT yet. We just admitted we destroyed Kaohe. Remember the mismanagement that everybody talks about? They just admitted it. But what they said was, but you can't destroy it anymore. Because it's already destroyed, so TMT, go up there. That's the logic. Exactly. So, from a legal standpoint, though, that's called evidence of the war crime. They just admitted to destruction of property. Yeah, mahalo. You got to be careful what you say, because what you say and sit and write can be used against you. So, that's destruction of property, and that's a crime. So that's my second point that I provided to Council Member Tamara Alton. The third, native tenant rights. The Kupuna who was arrested on July 10th had what is called native tenant rights. And I say that because your rights are still in the land despite what happened to the Hawaiian government in 1893. Despite what happened with the takeover and so-called annexation occupation thereafter. Those native tenant rights are secured and they're called vested rights. It's in Hawaiian statutes. It's not my interpretation. What that basically means and what I conveyed to Tamara Poulton, the only entity or people that have rights to Kaohe are the kupuna that you folks just, that may be arrested, not TMT not the University of Hawaii, not the state of Hawaii. 
And that's what happens when you start to understand genealogy. It starts to open up things that were never there before. But you know what we find out? When you start to apply football rules to a football game, you can actually come up with plays now. And not just be on the defense or thinking you're pitching a, a ball when you're actually in the line of a pulling guard getting about to get nailed because you don't know the game is football. Now, we got the game. So tomorrow, Paulton, put that letter together to President Lasner because that's the focus. The focus on Kaohe is not the state of Hawaii, Governor Ige. The focus is not the people here who are police. The focus is President Lasner, who represents the University of Hawaii, who has an invalid sublease with TMT, which would affect the construction company called Goodfellow, who is going to be doing the destruction. And then when they find out that there is an invalid lease, legally, now they are going to start asking questions because now their money that's coming in is going down the tube. That's like somebody coming in and saying, I'm going to build a jacuzzi in your back house, in your backyard. But they never asked for you. They never uh, asked your permission. But yet the guy doing it says, oh, but the guy next door said, I can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, brother, let me show you my deed. <laughs> I think, try to look at the tax map here. I think you are uh, one plot over. <laughs> so Tamara sent that off on July 9th. And then what happened? July 10th. President Lazar sends a response to Tamara about a week later. And President Lazner, instead of addressing the facts of what was laid before him and telling him to submit this to your legal counsel to refute, he says Governor Ige is taking care of things on the, on the Mauna. That is called escape and evade. See, the uh, Americans say that's the red herring. You know, they throw the herring is, uh, is a fish. They throw the red fish over there and say, hey, red herring, everybody looks this way. Hawaiians go, hey, look, a kule, throw the kule over here. No, no, stay focused. Don't worry where the kule fell or the herring, stay focused. Kaohe, where's the deed, where's the lease? So that, so this past Friday, Tamara asked me if I could help her put together a letter in response to President Lasner, zeroing in on that issue. And that is now happening behind the scenes. But what I want to share with you folks here, don't keep it behind the scenes. Talk about it. Called show me the lease, native tenant rights, destruction of property, right? We have to, we have to change the conversation. We still keep the cultural points. We still keep the mo'olelo. We just add these issues and say, hey, it's not us saying the lease is invalid. It's another state official from the county of Maui saying it's invalid, who's a chair of the land use committee. See, that's different. See, nobody has to say, oh, Dr. Sai said the lease is invalid. No. Tamara Palti just asked me my mana'o, then she took that mana'o, and now she's telling that to another official in the state of Hawaii called President Lasner. So what I wanted to do is just bring this to a close. And uh, it was so cool, Eric, where's Hi. Eric? Hi. Eric. <laughs> we, know, we know each other, go back a long time. Yo, Keanu, you know, hey, Kalamai was getting into your, your presentation. I said, bro, no, no, no. You guys play nahe nahe, and I come in with pa'i pa'i. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, oh, no, we can play pa'i pa'i too. I said, no, no, leave that to me. I'll, I'll, do, I'll let everybody say, oh, Keanu, Keanu's doing the pa'i pa'i. It's still nahe nahe. So with that, I just want to say it's good to be on the Mauna. Last time, as Kaohokahi shared, uh, he and I actually went off to Canada, Ottawa, to actually meet with the Royal Canadian Mountain Police about war crimes. Because Dexter Kayama was his attorney, but he couldn't make it. So he asked if I could go with Kaohokahi. And I got to tell you, that man, very Akamai. We actually had conversations about occupation. Not that I had to explain to him what is sovereignty, <laughs> what is international law. It was, like, it was like he knew it. So we go up to Ottawa, 
We filed a complaint. We're actually sitting with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and they're taking down information, right? And then it was submitted to their Attorney General. Which later, when I jump ahead, they got back to Dexter, the attorney for Kokai, and said they didn't refute the war crimes. They didn't refute Hawaii not being a part of the United States. They just said, well, Kaokahi is not Canadian, so we can't do anything. You notice what they just did? They just admitted to everything, but said he's not Canadian, so we can't prosecute. You know, if Hawaii was a part of the United States, what they should have said, uh, excuse me, wrong jurisdiction, uh, Hawaii is a part of the United States, you need to file your complaint with the American authorities, not the Canadian authorities. No, all they said was, He's not Canadian. That was like, okay, we got to get out of this one. So what I want to end with is, uh, so Kohokahi and I, while we're up in Ottawa, say, hey, we'll grab, grab some drinks in the bar in the, in the hotel. Let's, let's celebrate. This thing was received by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police right on. So we're talking. So I asked him, I said, hey, you know, Kohokahi, how, I, I noticed that you, you really know this information about Hawaii's occupation. You know, we're actually having conversations. I, I appreciate that. Not that I'm trying to say I need to, you know, I'm looking at some of some standard in order for me to talk to them. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. Not too many times I talk to people who, who, who we act, where we actually have a conversation. And he goes, Keanu. I go, yeah, what? I took your class. <laughs> <laughs> it was an online class, so I didn't know what he looked like. <laughs> and that was years back. And the class was called Introduction to the Hawaiian State. <laughs> and I went, as I looked back, now that is what education is about. <laughs> Mahalo. Yeah, and aloha aina. <laughs>